Hey, I want to welcome everybody that's online and especially our folks from Fredericksburg. You all were part of this celebration a couple of years ago and we're just so excited of how Fredericksburg is growing and continuing, and even our folks that are online. Um, we are going to continue in our series and we're actually going to wrap up this series of Esther. I hope you all have enjoyed it. I have loved doing this. I've gotten some great feedback from you all. And what we're going to do today, we're going to be in Esther chapter 7. And chapter 7 is really the downfall of Haman. I really, 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 really hope if you've been with us for the previous three weeks that you have read through this account. Uh, I, I want to call it a historical account because that's exactly what it is. And so often we call these things stories. But in my mind, when I say a story, I think of once upon a time. But these are, this is a historical account that happened, oh, roughly 2,500 years ago, okay? Um, and if you are f just joining with us, let me give you a recap, okay? Drunk King, uh, apparently a very attractive new queen, and an evil man that's trying to kill all the Jewish people. Does that about cover it? All right. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'll give you just a little bit more, all right? King Xerxes is the king of the Persian uh, Empire, consists of 127 provinces. Um, it is the first world superpower. It is, he oversees, King Xerxes oversees pretty much the entire known world at that time. There is uh, a celebration that he has, and eventually his initial queen chooses to disobey the king. And so she is removed, and Queen Esther, a Jewish orphan, rises. And we find out she is reared by her uncle Mordecai, a faithful Jewish man. We have the, the evil Haman, who is trying to eradicate genocide the Jewish people and manipulates the king to send out an edict throughout the entire known world on a certain day during a certain month you have permission in fact you are ordered to kill Jews and so Mordecai goes to this new queen this queen Esther and lays probably the biggest line on her that who knows who knows that maybe you have come to this position for such a time as this. And through prayer and fasting, Esther risks everything for the benefit of her people. As Jason spoke about last week, and I love this, throughout this entire book, the word God, Yahweh, is not mentioned, but God. But God is working throughout this entire account. And it is God that is going to use people to bring about the salvation of his people. And so today we're going to see the downfall, the great ironic twist within this historical account. And so we're in chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and follow along with us, okay? Chapter 7, verse 1. Queen Esther has come up with a plan through prayer and fasting. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite the king and Haman. And you got to understand, she is playing Haman like a cheap fiddle. It's actually God is playing Haman like a cheap fiddle right here. And Esther has come up with this plan that I'm going to invite the king and Haman over to a banquet. In fact, I'm going to invite him to two banquets. And so the first one, as Pastor Jason looked at last week, she came and really her request is, I just simply need for you to come back tomorrow night, the two of you to come back tomorrow night. And King, I promise you, I will tell you exactly what my plan is or exactly what my request is. And what she is doing is she is solidifying Haman's downfall. And so that's where we are. We are in the second banquet, the second day, and the king and Haman have come here. And so let's go ahead and start reading in Scripture. Chapter 7, verse 1, the book of Esther, I'm reading the NIV. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. 
And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom I'll be granted. And I love this. This is what Queen Esther does. The queen, then, uh, the queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. Now, I'll be honest with you as, you, as we read this, think about the king is almost oblivious to what she is asking here because he has, neither, do, neither does Haman know that she is Jewish, but in just a moment, she is gonna reveal that she was Jewish by not even saying I'm Jewish. She goes, if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. I will tell you that destroyed, killed, and annihilated is the exact same verbiage that was used in the edict that was sent out from the king to all the known world to kill and annihilate, to perform genocide. At this moment, all of a sudden, things are starting to slowly click. And I think the first one is Haman is sitting there, and if you think about this, this is a conversation. Imagine us having a conversation at a dinner table, and I just start talking, I'm laying stuff out, and you're kind of listening, but you really don't listen until somebody goes, yeah, and I'm talking about you. And that's what about to, ready to happen to Haman, because I believe Haman is all caught up in the thing that me and the king are with the queen, which means I'm the man which I am the man. I will tell you, there is a great, pat, there's a, one of my all-time favorite musical artists. And if you walk into my office, there's a poster of, I know you all are gonna say this is bad, but there's a poster of the Born to Run cover from Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Anybody? Oh Lord, am I the only one? Am I that old? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. If you're from New Jersey, you're either Springsteen or Bon Jovi. New York, I know it's Billy Joel, okay? But uh, I love Bruce Springsteen. And there is, uh, there's a line from Badlands, their song Badlands, an album that came out in 1978, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Wow, I'm really showing my age now. John, think about this before you speak, yeah. But in this line, it says, poor man want to be rich, rich man want to be king, and a king ain't satisfied till he rules everything. And I would tell you that I believe that that's Haman. See, Haman's downfall is really honestly going to be his absolute discontent, his desire to be the man. And what's happening at this banquet is all of a sudden Haman is starting to see the light of what it is to try to manipulate yourself into a position. He wasn't satisfied in being number two. He had to be number one. That's what's starting to happen here. We're going to continue on reading here. Uh, let's see. So the king, uh, so the king and Haman, we already went and covered over all that, uh, verses five and six, King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is this person that's wanting to take your life? Where is he? The man who dared to do such a thing. Now understand Esther is in great honor with the king. The king really, really likes the queen. Okay, and all of a sudden he's realized, who's, who's threatening my queen? Because if you're threatening my queen, you're threatening my crown. If you're threatening my crown, it's over. It's over. And I love what Esther does. Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. That vile Haman. Now, if I'm Haman 
and I'm listening to this in real time. It's coming along. I'm sipping my wine, and all of a sudden, my name gets thrown up with vile Haman. <clears throat> it's like one of those scenes out of a movie where wine comes out the nose, okay? Yeah. You're like, oh. And in that moment, I believe Haman's like, oh, no. What in the world is happening here? Esther's story, her account goes on. Then Haman was terrified, it says. He was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Now, if you're Haman, think about this. I, I had no idea. I will come up with a plan. I'm really sorry because all of a sudden, number two is about ready to become not even on the radar. All right? Why couldn't I have just been content in being number two? No. Just then, as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. I love this. Rabbinical teacher, teaching, old ancient uh, Jewish teaching said that the, uh, the angel Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, came behind Haman at that time and gave him a little shove and he fell onto the couch. I don't know if that's true or not, but I like it. I like it a lot. Now, you got to understand what has just transpired here. There's a number of things that have transpired in just this brief, tiny, little, like 15-second conversation. Haman has just realized that Esther is Jewish. The king has just realized he's been manipulated. And just, Haman just realized, I'm a dead man walking. What have I done? It's going to go on here. The king, the king, as he walks in, Mordecai is flopping on the couch where the queen is, which you don't touch the queen. You don't touch the queen. In fact, you don't touch anything that belongs to the king. And here he is flopped on the couch. <laughs> the, king, the king explained, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now, I tell you, when I was reading this earlier, I'm thinking about, you know those movie scenes where the van comes up, the door flies open, and the poor unsuspecting guy is walking down the street, and there's this thing that goes over their head, this black bag that goes over the head, gets thrown in the van, the van's gone, and he's never seen from again. That's kind of what's happening here. Haman's world is over. It's done. Imagine how it is when we come to realize in our pursuit of things that we want. Not what God wants, not what's good for others, but just what we want. How easily it is for us to fall from grace. How easily it is for us to all of a sudden go, what have I done? Now, I don't know about any of y'all, but I've got plenty of those moments in my life where living for the moment and living for me brings up this, what have I done? I have a very dear friend of mine that I consider a great friend, a young man that I coached years ago. And in fact, we did a highlight of him a number of years ago here. He came home for Thanksgiving break and he was having a few beers with some of his buddies and it was the early, early morning of Thanksgiving, super foggy out and the guys decided, hey, you know what, uh, we need nachos. Two o'clock in the morning after having a few beers on a foggy night, let's just go get some nachos. 
The store's five minutes down the road. What could possibly go wrong? He lost control of the vehicle. Single car accident. The car slammed into a tree on the passenger side of the car. His best friend is killed instantly. It was supposed to be five minutes. It was just for some nachos. But we didn't think through the whole thing. We lived for the moment and what we wanted. We want what we want when we want it. And we don't think through things. This is Mordecai. And the reality is, all of us can be Mordecai. I can be Mordecai. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. I call it the doo-doo chapter. I do what I don't want to do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do. Isn't it crazy how in our own fear, our own insecurities, our own thinking, how we can just goon things up? Proverbs tells us in 1618 that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. Esther's account goes on. Haman Head has been covered in verse 9. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits, 75 feet tall. A 50 cubit stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Now, I'm going to let you all in on a little secret because I know a bunch of you guys are sitting there going, how do they get a guy on a pole 75 feet up in the air? See, it was the question I had to ask. They actually lay it down. And I wish I could say that they gently placed the gentleman on it. They don't. But then they raised this thing up for everyone to see. 75 feet in the air. It's seven and a half stories tall. I don't think we have a building that tall in Stafford. So we would see that from just about anywhere. It's kind of like maybe the water tower over here. You see that from miles away. And Mordecai is stuck on that thing. Thank you. It was supposed to be Mordecai, but it's now Haman, the irony of ironies. And Haman is up there. I can't help but think as I'm reading this story, as I'm reading this account, and these are the things that we wrestle with as, as pastors and, and as preachers. Okay, what's the application here? How does this work out? How do we take this from the Old Testament to the New Testament? What is Jesus trying to teach us here? And as I began reading and preparing for this, there's one passage that kept on coming over and over and over into my mind is Galatians chapter 6. And I want to share this with you. In Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is talking about what it's like to live in the spirit versus living in the flesh. What it's like to live for oneself versus living by the fruit of the spirit. And let me just read this to you. Galatians chapter 6, it's not going to be up on the screen. Galatians 6, 19, he says, the acts of the flesh, what I want to do, are obvious sexual immorality and 
Let's try this again. These are apparently big SAT words for me today. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will never inherit the kingdom of God. Does any of this sound like Haman? Does any of it sound where you have lived for yourself, where I have lived for myself? I'll be the first one to say absolutely. When there is no peace within me, when there is no peace within us, I would venture to say that we are living by the flesh, not by the spirit. Because the fruit of the spirit, Paul goes on and says this, is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I'm okay not being number one. I'm okay. I want to be on the totem pole, but if I'm on the totem pole just holding it up, I'm okay with that. I don't have to be number one. And this world tells us that that is a pathetic way to look at things. It's okay to be a servant. It's okay to be number two. It's okay to be number three. And in fact, if we place ourselves at the number one spot, guess who automatically has dropped down on the totem pole? God. Haman totally took the equation of God out because it was all about him. Now, this is the passage that really drives home to me what happens here. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. This is the punchline. We will harvest what we have planted. Haman harvested death and destruction and received death and destruction. There's three things that I want you to see in this. One, first of all, is that God cannot be fooled. He ain't your mom and dad. Remember when you were in high school? Did you get your homework done? Oh, yeah. You ready for that test? Gonna ace it. How'd you get a 56 on it? I don't know. <laughs> Again, I may just be speaking about myself. We can fool a lot of people. If I dress the right part, if I say the right words, act a certain way, I can fool a lot of people, but I cannot, we cannot fool our God. Paul says that we are trying to mock God when we do that. We cannot fool our God. Haman thought that he could do whatever he wanted and there were zero consequences. There are natural laws that come into play. And there are supernatural spiritual laws that come into play in this life. The second thing in this is that, just as I said before, that we will harvest exactly what we plant. So my question for you and my question for me as I have wrestled with this scripture is what am I planting? What are the seeds that you are planting? Are you planting for yourself or are you planting for the kingdom? 
Are you planting for your advancement or are you planting for the advancement of others around you? What am I, what are you, what are we sowing? Because whatever it is that we put in the ground is what we will harvest. And the harvest, this is the third point, will always be later and it will be greater than what we think. That young man who went out for nachos will end up in a five-minute escapade. Spent two and a half years in prison for involuntary vehicular manslaughter. To this day, he is convicted of a felony. To this day, he has to deal with the reality that it was him driving the car that slammed into the tree and his best friend died. Five minutes for a lifetime. But on the flip side, there's so many things that we can plant. There are so many good things that we can plant when we invest in the lives of others, when we invest and spend time with Jesus, when all of a sudden the peace that was fleeting from us for so long is all of a sudden flooding us. It's beyond what our imagination can experience. And in the end, oh, what we imagine will pale in comparison. It will be later, but it will be so much greater than what we can even imagine. Paul tells us these words because he says this, do not grow weary in doing good. Though we may not see the harvest for doing good, we are planting seeds of love and we are planting seeds of Jesus and we are watering seeds of Jesus and we are watering the idea, the concept that we are, we are here to demonstrate and ex to, to show Jesus to a world. And I may never see the harvest we may never be aware of the effects that we have on other people until far later down the road. And it's always far greater than what we thought. Just yesterday, my wife and I, we went down to Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach was my stomping grounds. I'm going to invite the worship team to come, come on back out. Virginia Beach was our stomping grounds for about 20 years. And my Paul, you know how we're supposed to have a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy in our life. Someone who speaks into us, someone that we speak with, and someone that we are mentoring. The Paul, the Barnabas, and the Timothy. My Paul passed away. I haven't been back in Virginia Beach for, for years. And, but I walked into this church that I haven't been in in 20 years, almost 22 years. And I was first dumbfounded by how all these people got old. <laughs> Poor people. Good night. Because I look great. I used to have hair. Yeah. There was a gentleman that I remember 23 years ago. Could not get off drugs. Was running from the law constantly. And yesterday at that memorial service, he was standing up there with his dad and his niece. And before us was three generations of this family. And this man that I thought I maybe had the opportunity to throw some seed into his life that I didn't think took. I witnessed three generations of this family worshiping and leading a congregation in worship. 
He came up and gave me a hug and tears falling th- down his eyes. He goes, you'll never have, you'll, you'll never know the times that you spent, what they meant to me. He said, I've been clean and sober for 11 years and I'm worshiping God. I have a relationship with my daughter. I have a job and the law doesn't want anything to do with me. What are you sowing? I tell you that story, not, not, please don't hear me that I'm boasting about what I did. But I realize that there are things that we do that we may not ever see the fruit of it. But there will be a harvest so much greater than what we can ever imagine if we will be the people that Jesus calls us to be. Now, I will tell you that Haman and Esther, they wrapped it up. Or excuse me, Mordecai and Esther, they wrapped it all up. Boy, I keep on wanting to kill Mordecai, don't I? Yeah. (laughs) Mordecai will become the second most prominent man only to the king. But he did it because he sought God's wisdom. And he did it also to bring life to the Jewish people. Queen Esther, not knowing, but she chose to plant seeds of reconciliation and hope. And through their joint effort and allowing God to do what God does in the background, an entire Jewish nation is saved. And you know what the real irony of ironies of ironies is the Amalekites, the dreaded enemies of the Jewish people, whom God said that he will strike from the face of the earth. Do you know who the last Amalekite was? It was Haman and his 10 sons. The dreaded enemies of the Jewish people ended up on a 75 foot pole for everyone to see that God cannot be fooled. God cannot be mocked. And all of us will reap what we sow. Father God, I come to you and I thank you so much for your word and I thank you for who you are and I thank you that you have instructed us And not only instructed us, but that you fill us with your spirit so that we, we get out of the way. God, continue to allow your spirit to speak above all the distractions of the world. And God, change our hearts and our minds that we want to sow love. We want to sow Jesus. We want to sow peace. We want to sow unity. We want to sow you. And in doing so, Lord, we know that the harvest, though we may never actually partake of it, we know that it comes later and it will be far greater than anything that we can imagine. And God, my real prayer is for today that anybody who had someone else sow into their life Jesus, and today it's taking root, and that person wants to accept you as Lord, that today would be the day. If that is you today, I'm gonna ask that you pray this very simple prayer. God, I am a sinner in need of a savior, and I am asking you to forgive me of my sins and all the seed that I have sown for myself. Allow that seed to perish and may your seed sprout up and bring great fruit in my life. God, I am surrendering to you and your son, Jesus, today. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
If that is you this morning, either online or here at this campus or the Fredericksburg campus, I'm going to ask that you do something really, really bold, that you would walk up here. The prayer team will be up here at Fredericksburg. I know one of your pastors will be there. I'm going to ask that you would come up and say, listen, I just prayed that prayer. I have been sowing for myself for so long. I want to sow for Jesus. And in doing so, I promise you, at shoot, God's word promises you, the harvest will be plentiful and it'll be far greater than anything that you could ever imagine. And for you, believer, who has forgot what it is to sow the seed of Jesus, and let's face it, world life gets in the way, and you want to start sowing again, come on up, talk with the prayer team. Talk with me. We'll walk you through that. We do it not to embarrass you. We want to embrace you. We want to walk with you through this. Church, sow Jesus. Plant Jesus. And the harvest will be greater than anything that we can ever imagine. Amen.